Hey everyone, welcome to today's edition of One Single Story, where each weekday we tackle a single relevant question based on our Bible reading for that day. Um, This week, our reading is centered around the book of Acts, and today I'm joined by Alyssa Bream and Chris Rexrode, and our question today comes from our reading in Acts chapter 10. So Acts chapter 10 is um, the story where the Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit. Peter's praying, um, this... uh, he sees a vision. He he, God tells him to eat. He says, "Well, I can't. There's unclean animals." And God says, "Don't call unclean what I call clean." And you um, can have bacon cheeseburgers. Yeah, mm-hmm. man, bacon cheeseburgers, right? Yeah, <laughs> that was one of the first things I ate when we left Israel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I don't know. I made sure to eat all the shrimp and all that stuff. <laughs> all, when the, I got back. <laughs> all the things you couldn't eat while you were there. And so um, he. Peter goes down to Cornelius' house and he preaches um, to them. They have their devout, he talks about he's devout and God fearing. Um, Anyway, the, it says um, there toward the end of the chapter, it says he's telling them about Jesus. Uh, He's preaching about Jesus, you know, died, rose again. Um, It says, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came to Peter were came with Peter were amazed at the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too, for they heard them speaking with other tongues and praising God. Then Peter asked, "Can anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did?" So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterwards, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. So the question here is, why did the Gentiles speak in tongues, and what kind of tongues did they speak in? Because I look at it through the eyes of the people that would be there, specifically Peter even though he received that dream from God, and this is just me speculating, that he would need reassurance that what he is doing is right because everything that he had been taught before growing up as a Jew, this would not have been permissible at all, even walking into their house. So to go and include them as equals into your belief system would have been just like unheard of. So to see the sign is another confirmation from God saying that this this is the right thing to do, that I'm I'm involved with this as well. And what tongues they spoke in, I'm I'm not sure. That's good. That's because you didn't grow up Pentecostal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna defer to Steve on this one. <laughs> yeah, she she grew up in the same Oh, did you? Yep. Oh, okay. Kind of tribe I, idea. I, oh, I almost, what do you guys think? We're both nutcases. <laughs> I almost had Jay on this too. I was like, we can't have three Pentecostals. Yeah, on, on the Book of Acts. <laughs> on the Book of Acts. Um, so, for the original question, I think we have to remember that when Christianity, when I think we even heard it called the Way earlier in the mm-hmm. book, um, started, it was a Jewish sect almost. It was like Jewish people who had this, had a little bit of change of belief and that that's what they thought. So to include the Gentiles was a big leap. So I think this was a sign to the people who were there that like, like kind of like Chris said, that they were included in this, this new way, this new way of thinking that it wasn't just a Jewish kind of slight deviation that there was, it was a new way of thinking. Right. It wasn't a modification of Judaism. Right. Yeah. It was full blown. Right. And new. Something new. And I mean, we see that play out as things progress. And now, I mean, if you were to say that Christianity is a, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's a totally separate religion. Now there's, there's a lot more differences. Um, so what languages? I mean, other tongues. I think you got two options. <laughs> you either have heavenly languages or you have in a language that they don't know. I know that. So it, is that can you can you can I can, can I can you ascertain which no, one? No, that no. Was? Well, can you <laughs> offer up a, a an explanation of what your view of the difference between a heavenly language and um, 
an earthly language would be. Mm. So here, I will probably know, but I'll give you some. When I was in, so I went to a, a Pentecostal Bible school and one of the papers I did, and I don't even remember what the whole paper was on, but um, on missions and Pentecostal missions. And one of the beliefs that they had when Pentecostals were kind of a fresh breed in the mm. 1900s was that the gift of languages was so that they didn't have to go to language school to be able to go preach the gospel to other groups of people. Because we see in... Um, when the Holy Spirit first fell, that people were walking by and they're like, wait, they know my language. I'm not from here. Why is that? So we know that there are times that it's languages that other people know. I mean, I've, I, you hear that all the time. We're like, <laughs> I hear that all the time. I've heard that all the time. We're like, this person would be praying and like someone from another country standing next to them. They're like, they were praying perfectly in my language. As I, mm -hmm. I heard just last week, actually. A week ago today from when we're recording this, um, a story someone was retelling, and they were talking about the history of a particular church. It's, they were telling this story, the, the history of this church, and at the time it was in this uh, poor section of town, old wood frame building, and um, there was an immigrant man from Belarus that... Um, he had moved here alone, tried to, wanted to get his family back over here. So this was probably 40s or 50s. And um, life was tough. He was struggling. Um, the church would have been in Dan Danville, Virginia. So it's not terribly far from here. And um, he, he was struggling and contemplating suicide and just out walking, you know, at this particular moment. And he passes by this church, this, this Pentecostal, old school Pentecostal church. And, you know, it's the summertime. They've got their windows up and that wouldn't have been uncommon during that time. And they're shouting and having a big time. And um, he relays, he relayed the story that the man from Belarus did um, that, as he passed by that church, he clearly heard a lady in that church speaking in his native tongue and telling him that God loved him and he needed to come come in and receive Jesus that night. And um, that that is, and for the most part, people, including yourself, Chris, that didn't grow up in Pentecostalism is a... It's typically how most non-Pentecostals um, accept tongues, that they are, God uses them in a moment to speak specifically to other people. Okay. Obviously, you and I didn't grow up that way. It was different, you know. Um, and I can assure you some of the stuff I heard was not, <laughs> it was not real tongues. <laughs> it was well that too. Yeah, but it was it was definitely not a foreign language, you know, because I'm not an ignorant human being. You know, I know a language when I hear it. Mm -hmm. That that you know, there are some commonalities between all languages. You know, there are certain words that when you hear them, you know what it mean. It doesn't matter if it's French or Spanish or Italian or you know whatever. Um, but the, the the question becomes, the, the, because if you are if you come from a, well let me let me let me say this, I, I'm not a cessationist. I still believe in in speaking in tongues. I believe it has a particular purpose and a place. And I do think there it is twofold. Um, one, I do believe that at times God uses it to speak to other people, and in those times, I believe two things have to happen. Um, either it has to be in a language that is speaking to that person, and you know I can give you other examples that I, I'm aware of, or there has to be an interpretation for the people mm -hmm. in, that are present. Um, I think that privately it becomes a 
almost a form of worship, you know, right. in, in private worship. That's how I would describe it for, for people. And because I think we see biblically that it is the, the tongues piece of it is for is the it edifies the speaker. You know, so the person doing the speaking gets edification from it. So there has to be some type of worship that's built into it. Um, and, and it's not necessarily for the edification of others. I do believe in this case, there's a couple of things, you know, and some of this is my Pentecostal theology coming out that still holds root in places. I don't ascribe to... Um, it being the initial evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the, that's where, what I grew up in. I don't ascribe to that anymore. Um, I do believe it is an evidence or can be an evidence, but I don't believe it is the evidence. Um, but it's interesting that everyone listening, it says, began to speak in or the Holy Spirit fell on everyone mm -hmm. that was present. So the ones that had already received the Holy Spirit experienced it again, and the ones that had never received it experienced it uh, brand new for the first time. Um, and I do believe that the purpose of it here was to signify to those Jews that were in the room. Because Peter, I think, probably is already more convinced than maybe the others that he took with him. Right. Um, but because he's had a dream, he's had that vision from God and God's clearly spoken to him. Uh, but I think they needed a sign. And I do believe God will give us signs so that we can accept people, you know, because this was a, as Alyssa alluded to when we first started, this was a leap, you know, this was a huge, mm -hmm. huge leap. Um, it is it is not much different than, say, someone from a Methodist or a Baptist background accepting Pentecostalism. You know, it, it, it is some different. You know, we, we're followers of Christ, but it's enough of a deviation that people get all itchy about it, you know. Yeah, to, to them, it would have been somewhere between sinful and heresy. Right. Yeah. Closer to heresy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I don't. In the environment that you came from, it would be considered heresy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if somebody busted up in the church you, you moved here from and started speaking in tongues, yeah, they would call security. Yeah, if you had one, and especially the one I grew up in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we didn't have many tongues in the Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there are there are spirit filled Catholic movements now. Yeah. Um, charismatic Catholics, I think is what they're called. Is that right? What are you laughing at? Just a story that from a parent, from a Catholic who experienced charismatic Catholic, and they, they just ran out of there. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Were they Pentecostal? No, they were, they were, it was a Catholic priest you're having dinner with, and when he found out we were Pentecostal, he told us a story, and he said the woman in front of him was speaking in tongues, and she was in, and her zipper just started falling down, and he just ran out of there. <laughs> oh, wow, yeah, yeah. That would get me out of there, too. <laughs> you know, it, when you're not, I do think the Lord has to prepare us and prepare our hearts for some situations that we we're not prepared to accept. Um, the The one time, like I could give an example of this, and I think I probably have used this on this podcast before, but I grew up with no dancing unless you were moved on by the Holy Spirit. Like there was And you had a flag at the altar. Oh no, that was that was <laughs> that came after my time. Yeah. No. And and well, that's not my favorite pastime anyway. But anyway, you had to be moved on by the Holy Spirit. Certainly no choreographed dancing. And um I remember on a Sunday morning I was getting ready to go preach at my first church. And I was watching a church, and this girl got up, and she did a choreographed dance to We Shall Behold Him. And I remember how moved I was watching it. You know, just the Holy Spirit. She was obviously, it was, it was worship for her. I mean, it was clear it was worship for her, no doubt. And um, I, the Lord worked in my heart that day about that very thing that, 
that that was something that I believed was wrong, sinful, frankly, that was being used for his glory and worship. And and sometimes God has to work in particular ways so that we can see and accept and understand things and don't exclude people for no reason. I guess with with what I've grown in, I understand to a degree. I definitely believe in the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues to where you can miraculously um, speak another language mm-hmm. that people on earth understand. And I do understand the concept of a heavenly language or an angelic language, a language that none of us speak, but when it was spoken, God used it as a sign so that if you, if you spoke it and I understood it and people around us were kind of like, what were you guys just saying? It made no sense. That would be some sort of validation of the Holy Spirit working in that mm-hmm. moment. Where I where I personally have the rub is when I'm around a group of people that all of a sudden just break into spontaneous, to me, chaos. Mm-hmm. That I kind of lean back on the scripture where, where, where Paul's talking about if I speak in tongues and it's not teaching people because they don't understand, then I should just be speaking in a normal language. It, to me, maybe you guys can lean in on this. There might be people with the same question. Is that authentic or is that just group participation and trying to be a part of something? Well, the short answer is yes. (laughs) It's both. As I understand, if I, one person breaks out and somebody interprets it, but for a yeah, whole group of I, people, I would, I would, there would be a couple of things I would say about that. One, I've had, I didn't grow up in that environment. Okay. The, the mass, everybody busting out speaking in tongues was not. It didn't happen in churches. My dad passed it. He would have shut it down. Okay. Um. But and I remember my first experience, and we so. The the form of Pentecostalism that I grew up in, I we did not view um, speaking in tongues as something that we controlled. You were moved upon by the Holy Spirit, so it was an utterance of the Holy Spirit. It's, that's the way I would have described it growing up. And I was sixteen, went over to a church in Greenville, actually. Um, I was in high school, and I went to see uh, Phil Driscoll play, and they it was a it was a very charismatic church. So the charismatic movement was fairly fresh in the early '80s. So this would have been '84, '83, '84, um, and they you know they did they danced and they waved flags, which was a new thing for me. You know at that point. Um, uh, All of the things that I wasn't accustomed, completely accustomed to. So charismatic, the charismatic movement was um, much more built around, um, Alyssa, help me out here, Um, exuberant worship, you know, everybody in the room, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. displayed their personality. That might be how I would say it, toward God. Uh, It was very expression-oriented. Uh-huh. The charismatic movement was, and you could express it with a flag, you know, or, or a lot of other things. And they got up. The guy before Phil Driscoll got up, he the pastor got up and took the offering, and he said, "Now let's all pray in our own prayer language." And it scared the <laughs> stuff out of me. I mean, I left. I didn't even stay to watch Phil Driscoll. It scared me to death because I wasn't used to that. Now, today, it wouldn't bother me, okay? I wouldn't think nothing about it. I was like, yeah, y'all are crazy, and I'm just going to stay. <laughs> that's what I would. That's how I would feel about it mm-hmm. today. I, and, and it's not that I believe they were crazy. My answer to you is about group corporate uh, speaking in tongues is most of them would say that is that it's a it's a worship language. It's a prayer language. It is. And they would have scriptures, and I could point you to some of those about praying in the Spirit at all times. Whether that means speaking in tongues or not is a whole other conversation. That's a different. Maybe we'll tackle that when we get to that book. Um, but um, whether it means that or not, I don't know. But um, 
that would be their interpretation of it, that they all can. The, the thing you have to balance and the, the thing that as a pastor that I recognize is a, is a struggle is in corporate environments, you expect there to be unbelievers in the room. Mm-hmm. And you don't want it to be a stumbling block. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't want your, I think, I think the, the writers of the New Testament made that very clear. Don't let your freedom in Christ become a stumbling block to somebody else who doesn't doesn't know so you have to you have to know you know if it's a, if it's a full on everybody's good with it i i'm fine with it like i, I don't i'm not going to i certainly wouldn't view it as heresy um but i i also believe you got to be careful about knowing who's in that room and becoming a stumbling block to them to somebody who would say oh my gosh you know calling into question your christianity yeah Alyssa, you got anything you want to add to that I think for somebody who regularly uses a prayer language, it is definitely like, you know, they've done, they've done some scientific studies on people who speak in tongues and like it is, it lights up different parts of their brain and like it, it's real. So I think there is a prayer language. I think when people get, when a group of people all get really excited about their prayer language and all are mass shouting it, it just turns into chaos. So I don't disagree that that is not really the purpose of it to like Mm -hmm. be shouting it all together, um, at least the way I view it. Um, But I don't think there always needs to be an interpretation in for it to be beneficial to that person. Now in a group setting, there's different yeah. Different rules, different uses, different purposes. The okay. speaker is edified at that point, right. not the risk, not the hearer. You know that there's you, there's scripture to back that up. The speaker is the one edified without an inner interpretation. Well, thank you for joining us today on this edition of One Single Story. We hope you'll be back tomorrow as we continue our conversation around the Book of Acts. <laughs>